We've got 1101 here in Highland, New York. And I am going to go ahead and begin because it looks like we've got most of our attendees here. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Carolyn Bennett Glauda, and I'm here at Southeastern New York Library Resources Council representing New York's Hudson Valley. And you are here at Minecraft 101, a discussion of Minecraft programming in the library. We have um, four presenters joining us today from Long Island. They are James Hartman, Jessica Brightman, Lisa Zuena, and James Hutter. And um, in a few minutes, they will introduce themselves before we begin so you can get to know which voice belongs to which person. Um, and before I turn it over to them, I just have a few housekeeping notes. First and foremost, uh, if you're having any te technical difficulties at all with your sound or your audio or your viewing or anything, um, please contact my colleague, Zach. Uh, he's here to help you. He's on the line now, and you can either contact him via email, phone, or chat. And that goes for the, he'll be on for the duration of the webinar. And uh, lucky you, this is a live interactive webinar, and we encourage you to participate. You are all muted, but um, the you have the ability to use chat at any time. Um, and the presenters and I are both using our audio. Uh, and I hope that, you know, I'm coming in loud and clear, and we'll test the sound with our presenters in just a moment. Um, they're sharing a microphone, and that they're going to pass amongst themselves so that everyone should come in clearly. Um, we're the only ones with the audio enabled, so use the chat. And uh, you can see right there, that's what the chat looks like. If you're not hearing us clearly and your speakers are set up properly, please let Zach know, and he can help you out. Another way that we can participate today is by using the raise hand icon. Generally, we use yes, um, it, agree is yes, and disagree for no. And uh, go ahead and use the applause button if the mood strikes you. Uh, we'll do our best to keep an eye out for raised hands so that you can participate and ask questions that you might have for the presenters. The webinar is being recorded, so don't worry if you need to step away or miss something. I'll do my best to have the full recording up on our website later this week, and I will send you that link along with an evaluation. So now that we're all set, uh, let's try out the applause button to give our presenters a warm welcome. And I'm going to switch it over to you, your presentation, guys. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, there you go. Okay, there you go. Great. So it looks like the presentation is loading here. I'll just advance. This presentation is based off of uh, a popular seminar we did here in Nassau County, New York, uh, that we called Minecraft 101. And basically, uh, a lot of libraries had heard about Minecraft, a very popular video game. And the four of us had a lot of experience using Minecraft as a tool to uh, get people into the library, especially younger users. So we wanted to share that knowledge with others. Uh, so let me go ahead and introduce myself. I am James Hutter. I work for the Westbury Memorial Public Library. I'm also the chairperson of the Computers and Technology uh, committee for the Nassau County Library Association. I'm James Hartman. I am the Digital Services Librarian at Hewlett Woodmere Public Library, and I'm the one of the co-chairmen of the Nassau County Library Association website committee. Hi, I'm Lisa Zuen. I'm the adult librarian at the Massachusetts Public Library. Um, I've been playing Minecraft for years, and it's something I'm really excited to bring to my team. And I'm Jessica Brightman. I'm a children's librarian at Belmore Memorial Library. And here on the screen, we have uh, two of our little Minecraft avatars that we <laughs> use to play the Minecraft game, uh, particularly teacher mode. So basically, today, what we're going to do during the webinar is we're going to cover a few different things. Uh, we're going to give you an overview of what Minecraft is. We're going to talk about what platforms you can run the Minecraft software, the video game, on. We're going to talk about different applications for Minecraft in public libraries. And then we're going to take a little Q&A at the end of the uh, session. Okay, so a question that I get a lot from other colleagues in the library and from parents is, what is Minecraft? They know it basically as a game that their kids play. They have no idea what it is, how it works. And simply put, it's a sandbox construction game. And what that means is that it's an open world game. There's no linear story that they have to worry about. There's really no goals 
other than the goal that you set for yourself. Um, it was created by Marcus Persson. He's, um, he's a Swedish uh, tech person, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and he founded uh, Mojang, which is the company that owned Minecraft before uh, Microsoft bought it over. Um, the game involves the player uh, placing and breaking various types of blocks in a 3D environment. Um, so if that doesn't make any sense for you, that sense to you, think of it as Legos on steroids. Um, instead of the Legos being physical in front of you, it's all on the screen, the, the world made up of these blocks that you can interact with. Um, and then you can collect them, you can build with them, you can build structures, artwork, pretty much anything um, that the imagination is capable of. Um, and you can play it alone, or you can play it on a multiplayer server with other people. So there's countless ways that you can really play the game. Okay, so if you, if you really don't know what Minecraft is, this is Minecraft. This is a great frame of reference for you. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, in our original presentation, we had a YouTube video that we had shared. But for the case, you know, for webinar purposes, we've included a screenshot. And there's actually a lot going on in this screenshot, but it gives you a good idea of what Minecraft looks like. So Minecraft is a randomly generated world, so that's why you see all these hills and mountains and things like that, and those are different on every server, and for they're different for every player. Off to the left, you can see a little basic house, and then a little player, the little avatar is also on screen there with like a light blue shirt. Uh, you can see a lake in the middle there, at the bottom of the hill, and you can see some wolves off to the right side, a pack of wolves. There's trees and things like that. But basically, throughout the world, and the world is huge, you're going to see an environment that looks very similar to this. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts about um, yeah, the, well, Just really quick, the world is randomly generated. Um, so it's using math formulas that, you know, it's probably beyond most of our comprehension to create this. So it's going to be different every time you start it up. Yeah, so it's not boring. It's basically yeah. a fresh experience every time somebody tries to play it. All right, so I'm now going to give a very brief history about how Minecraft all started. As Lisa said before, the game was created by Marcus Person. You've probably heard of him before, but probably by his nickname, Notch. So Notch created a game seven years ago. Um, he created the game over the course of one weekend. And about a month after he created Minecraft, he started selling copies of it online. I believe that 40 copies were sold its first weekend on sale. And soon after, people started talking about the game. And it wasn't because they liked the game per se, it was because they had no idea how to play. They had no clue. Minecraft came with no instructions, there were no rules, um, there's no storyline to follow, so players were left to their own devices to figure out how to play the game. Later in 2009, multiplayer mode and survival mode were both introduced, and we're going to talk about that more later in the presentation. So fast forward to July 2010, a PC gamer interview brings Minecraft more publicity. The magazine also rates Minecraft as not the first, but the fourth best game to play at work. So it's no surprise that in September of that year, a Minecraft server crashes because so many people are suddenly purchasing and downloading the game. So when they headed in, so when um, they headed games in and everyone, that was really a turning point. Can I interrupt you guys for a second? Um, I'm sorry to do this. You you have uh, your audio is cutting yes, out thanks. a little bit. We've been noticing it sure. going in and out. Would you? I'm so sorry to interrupt your presentation, but would you mind just running the audio setup again? Um, I think that might help. All right, everyone. Uh, all attendees, thank you so much for bearing with us. We're just going to run through the audio again so that we had really good sound on our dress rehearsal. Um, so we can probably achieve that good sound quality again. So I've got the microphone in my hand, and I just so uh, you know I just ran through the audio setup, and we've boosted the volume a little bit, and I think we'll try to speak a little bit slower, mm -hmm. uh, just so hopefully the microphone can pick up everything that we're saying. But uh, is everything sounding okay now as I speak to the audience? Yeah, that. Okay. So better. on that note, oh, excellent. Okay, so that's good to hear. All right. Thank you guys so much. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's very reassuring. Yeah, thank okay. You. So I'm going to actually hand the mic back over to Jessica, who just finished uh, talking about the items on this slide.
All right, thank you, James. Okay, so I'll just jump right back in. So I was saying that 2011 was really a turning point in Minecraft history. First, the famous adventure update was released, introducing more features and different creatures into the game. And then in the fall of 2011, Minecraft was introduced to Android and iOS devices. Up a point, it was just computer games, so this was really a big move. And then at the end of November, Minecraft is officially released. Even though at this point it was around for two years, it was still in its beta phase, meaning that Notch and the crew over at Mojang were still working out the kinks and fixing up the game. And then on November 19th, Jens Burdenston, known as Jeb, takes over and really creates the Minecraft we know and love today. And it's a brief history of Minecraft. So as far as popularity goes, uh, back in 2011, right when Minecraft had just started out, it was that one month into its beta phase, it had already hit one million purchases, which is a huge number in, in by any metric. Uh, later that year, only a few months later, it hit 16 million registered users and over 4 million purchases. So there was a lot of people playing this game. It was riding in popularity, like we were saying. It's, you know, the servers are crashing. Everyone's using it. By the time we fast forward to 2014, 100 million users are playing Minecraft. So this is, they're playing online, they're playing locally, they're playing everywhere. And by October 2014, it had sold 17 million PC copies, becoming the best-selling uh, uh, computer game of all time, and sold about 60 million copies total, including all the different mobile versions and the uh, console versions, making it one of the uh, highest grossing video games of all time. Just to put this into perspective, uh, the uh, Nash was actually in a bidding war and won for a giant mansion, and he outbid this uh, this lovely young couple, Jay-Z and Beyonce, who also won this house, but he had so much Minecraft money that he, uh, he beat them out and he got a new house out of it. Okay, so the question is, why is Minecraft so popular? Well, it has very, very simple core concepts. You can build, you can survive, and you can mine. So you can build using the blocks made, that make up the world, you survive monsters, and you can mine various ores. So basically, you can make the game whatever you want it to be. Um, you can actually play the game alone. The world is almost endless. Like we said before, it's randomly generated, so you're going to get a different experience every time you load it up. Um, by yourself, you can explore the world, you can build your own towns, your own houses, you can farm. It can be a very relaxing experience, or you can go out and fight monsters, you know, whatever you're in the mood to do. Um, you can also play it cooperatively with friends, and I think this is why it's such a great thing to have in a library, because rather than the kids playing alone on the computers, they can play together with each other on a server, and we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and they can also fight each other in monsters. Um, there's also several mobs to find in the game, and a mob is going to be either monsters or animals, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but just really quickly, there are passive and aggressive mobs, so you're either going to find mobs that won't attack you or mobs that will. <laughs> uh, monsters like creepers and zombies, um, you can fight them and they will attack you without being provoked. Um, wolves and ocelots won't attack you, if you um, unless you provoke them. You can actually tame them, and they'll follow you around. And then there's different like farm animals like pigs and cows and sheep that you can farm and we're going to go into this in a little bit. Another reason why Minecraft is so popular I think is because of its creative elements. As Lisa said before, Minecraft is often compared to Legos. Um, it's called Legos on steroids, virtual Legos, Legos for this generation. And the reasoning is really twofold. It's partly due to the popularity, especially among children, especially among young boys. And also because just like Legos, Minecraft provides a platform for people to build and create. And one of the biggest trends we're seeing with Minecraft is these building competitions. And we're seeing them on small scale and large scale events. Um, an example of a small scale event, um, at my library, for instance, we had this building competition right before the holiday break last month. Um, we had about 10 kids that came to the library and they had a chance to build their own igloos. So that was pretty fun. But we're also seeing really large scale events like the International Minecraft Builders Bowl that took place in 2015. Um, the competition uh, was for students of all ages and the final round took place in Paris. So that was pretty neat. Jump in for one second. Um, in our presentation, we had a number of links that we shared with the audience, and a lot of them were YouTube videos. And when we talk about creativity and things that you can build in Minecraft, we had shown some examples 
Um, I, they might be on the PDF that Carolyn has that we will share with the attendees. But, but I highly recommend that people go to YouTube and type Minecraft into search box. And you'll see really awesome examples of really complex, complicated things that people have made in Minecraft. Thank you, James. Yeah, so one of the great things about Minecraft, like we were saying, is that creativity aspect. Uh, one of the big things that the kids can do uh, is uh, program the game with some mods or modifications. So again, at my library, we bought a bunch of computer books where it's teaching basic programming, that kind of things, to alter the alter the gameplay, alter the box, make, you know, you can make the, the player run faster, you can alter the animals, that they become different mobs or become hostile, become tameable, that type of thing. It's fantastic in terms of STEM, the STEM aspects of it. Uh, there are camps and after-school programs all around doing it. For example, there's a, a university here on Long Island called the Delphi University that has an ID tech camp that teaches, has a whole session in, in Minecraft modding. One of the other great things that they can do uh, really easily, which is something you can implement at your library, it doesn't take that, it doesn't take any real knowledge at all, is they can reskin the game, which is, that's your main character right there. His name is Steve, and you can actually choose, and you can either design your own in Photoshop or in Paint or something like that, or download them from a bunch of different websites. If you search Minecraft skins, you can change the outfits. So this one, Steve's dressed as Batman. When I play my guy, I got him years ago. He runs around like Iron Man. There's Star Wars ones. There's Princess ones. There's anything you can think of. They've taken it and adapted it to be available in Minecraft. And again, there's a link to that in the PDF, a website that has a lot of these different skins. Uh, when it comes to Minecraft, there's some lingo that everyone should know. Uh, these are some just helpful terms to know. Creepers, uh, you'll, hear, you'll hear the kids talk about creepers. They're one of the most volatile and popular mobs in the game. Uh, they explode when they're provoked, which is a little bit dangerous. Uh, there's the end world and the net world. So those are dimensions within the game that players can access by crafting portals. Uh, and you'll see them switching between dimensions and doing different activities, whether in the end of world or the nether world. Um, PE stands for Pocket Edition. And when we talk about Minecraft on tablets or on your smartphone, it's generally going to be the Pocket Edition that you would be running on there. And Steve. Steve is the name of the default main player in Minecraft. So if you need to know more about these terms, or if you find teens in your library asking you about different aspects of Minecraft and you simply don't know the answer, we would say definitely go to the official Minecraft wiki. Uh, it's a great resource for basically knowing anything there is to know about Minecraft. And again, that link is also in the PDF that will be shared with everyone. OK, so a few more things you may want to know before you dive into Minecraft. Um, you're going to hear the word blocks used a lot, and that's, what's, that's what makes up the world. Um, they can be mined, and they can be used to build structures. Um, there's all different types of blocks. Um, there's wood, stone, dirt, and sand. And you're going to use the different tools in the game, like picks and axes, to collect these materials. Um, biomes is another word you might hear. And those are just the various regions of the world. Um, and each has its own unique structures and weather events. So in a forest, it's going to be pretty you know, boring, I guess. There's just going to be trees and pretty standard animals, like some chickens you may see and some cows. Um, if you see a taiga, that's, those are really cold areas. So those, that's going to be one of the few areas where, where snow will fall um, and so forth. Um, then some game mechanics that you may hear. You may hear the word craft. And on the right side of the screen, you're going to see a little picture. Um, that's, that's the crafting window. And that's what kids are going to use to build items. So in this, for example, we've got two sticks, and then there's an iron ingot, ingot on top, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and when you draw it like that, you're going to get a shovel. Um, and if you put the little iron ingot, if you put two more on that top row, you'll get a pickaxe. So there's all different sorts of schematics that the kids know. And it, don't worry about knowing them all. Like James had said before, go to the wiki. They have all the different crafting schematics to build everything in a game. Um, smelting is similar. Um, when, you, um, when you mine different ores, such as gold or iron, if you put it into an oven, it'll come out as those ingots, which then the kids can use to build. Um, there's also going to be enchanting, and that's going to upgrade your tools, armor, and weapons. And in order to enchant things, you have to gain experience. So that's what the level up system is in this game. Rather than making the player stronger, you can use those XP points to make your tools, armor, and weapons stronger. 
Um, and you can collect these little green orbs when you kill monsters and you can mine materials. So that's how you gain uh, XP in this game. Okay, so Lisa spoke before about the different mobs that you find in the game. And when we talk about Minecraft mobs, we're not talking about the mob. <laughs> we're just talking about the living creatures in the game. And they're really one of the most icon iconic features of Minecraft. Um, there's a lot of different creatures, and players will recognize that each creature has their own kind of characteristics and personality, so they're a lot of fun. And you basically have three categories of mobs. You have your passive mobs, which include your farm animals, like your pigs, your sheep, your chickens, your cows, and they will not attack the player. Um, you could actually use them for food or for supplies. You then have your tameable mobs, that includes your wolves and your horses. And once they're tamed, they'll actually follow the player around as they explore the vast Minecraft universe. So that's cool. And but, but probably the most popular of all the mobs are your hostile mobs. So that includes all your monsters, your creepers, your endermen, which are, is the last um, creature in that little row on the bottom. Um, spiders, skeletons, there's even something called a zombie pigmen. So they're pretty grotesque looking and they're really vicious. So those are, um, you got to watch out for them because they come out at night usually and they will attack the player and if they can, they'll try to kill you. So you just got to watch out for those guys. So there's two different types, well, actually three different types of Minecraft that you may use in libraries. Uh, one that we use here is Minecraft EDU, which is a special uh, education version of the software. There's the commercial edition, which you can buy, and then there's also the pocket edition, which we had mentioned is available for like tablets and smartphones. Uh, Minecraft is available on both PC and Mac, but not Chromebooks. And I know people have asked about that in the past because a lot of libraries have Chromebooks that they circulate and things like that. And unfortunately, Minecraft is not supported on the Chromebook. Uh, when we talk about two different forms of terminology here, clients and servers, clients are individual players that join uh, a server and play the game. Servers allow multiple players to play together. Uh, people have asked when it comes to running a server what sort of hardware you would need to do so. And in our experience here at Westbury, you basically are going to need a computer that's Windows 7 or above. You're going to need at least 4 gigabytes of RAM. And we've tried running this on older computers, and we had nothing but problems. So just a general rule of thumb is that you basically are going to want a machine that's less than three years old. OK, so what's the difference between Minecraft EDU and the regular commercial edition that you can download from the uh, Mojang website? Um, Minecraft EDU is exclusively available to schools, museums, nonprofits, and libraries. So that's obviously a very good choice for us because we have access to it. Um, if you do choose to buy Minecraft EDU, you do get access to the regular commercial edition of the game. So you can play that regular edition through Minecraft EDU. Um, but the reason you may want to get Minecraft EDU for your library is that they have an easy-to-use server that comes with many different management tools um, that educators and librarians would find useful, where the public may not find those features useful. We're going to go into a little more detail about what those features are, but they're basically things like being able to dis disable chat and freezing players. So, you know, that'd be nice to do in the commercial version when you're playing with your friends, but may not necessarily be useful. Um, and the Minecraft EDU also comes with different lessons and activities that you can use in a classroom setting or in a library program setting. Um, just one thing to definitely keep in mind if you do want to get Minecraft EDU for your library, it cannot run on smartphones or tablets. So this is a PC or Mac thing only, so there's no mobile devices. Thank you, Lisa. So yeah, so where, uh, generally, James and I are going to be speaking in the next few slides, or mostly other James rather than me, but I would say we're, we're big fans of the Minecraft EDU uh, sort of setup. So the general pricing is you start with that server, which is your base rollout cost. It's $41. That's what you'll, you can load onto a computer. And all the kids will be, whether you have, you know, you're using it as a team program or you're having kids from the children's rooms just log in, they'll all be on that same server, they'll be able to share that. And then for each computer or sort of player computer that you're going to be using, you'll have to purchase a user license, which runs um, for $18, I and mean, then it's 14 if you when you uh, do a bulk discount, versus the commercial edition costs $27. At that point, if you had the commercial edition, you'd have to create a Mojang account for each computer going to use it. 
uh, they can't be logged in simultaneously, so it's one of those you'd have to end up having multiple accounts, remembering logins and passwords, and like Lisa had said before, it's really, you're not going to be able to sort of manage it as well as you can manage the, e uh, the Minecraft EDU version. So that EDU version, you spend the $41 for the server, the $18 for however many computers you want on it, and then that gives you all that access, like we were saying, more muting players, being able to change the world, use different world types where you can either use survival mode where you, the kids start out with nothing. They have to, you know, the, you know that was the original process of the game. You'd have to dig through the dirt, mine some iron, build, you know, your swords, your weapons, your tools, that kind of thing. That's that actual game where the creepers can come in and blow your stuff up. Then there's also the creative one, which we've had a lot of luck in our libraries using, where it starts out, they get dropped into the game, they have a full inventory, anything they want to build, they can immediately start, you know, making a city, making a town, recreating, you know, pixel art, that kind of thing. Uh, there's, it's sort of that god mode where you can fly around, you can do whatever you want. That's, again, it's more creative, it's, it's a little bit easier, and it's generally, it's fun for those younger kids and anybody that just wants to build as opposed to playing the actual, the, uh, the older survival mode. I think just from my own personal experience here at Westbury, I would recommend that people try to steer clear of the commercial edition in public libraries, and if you can, try to consider buying the EDU client software. It's just much easier to manage and to use. Uh, there's a lot less confusion when you install it and set it up. So I don't want to get too technical, but we did just want to show people the uh, server software. Uh, it's all click-based. There's all dialog boxes. There's simple buttons to click through in order to set up a server. Uh, this is the screen when you first launch the server software. Basically, you would click that box in the middle there, Start Minecraft EDU Launcher. You would then click the box Create New World. And then from there, you're going to start getting into some of the basic settings for a server. Uh, you could set the amount of players that you'd want to have connect at one time. We've set ours to 30. Uh, if you're using an older computer, you may have to knock that down to, like, say, 20 or 15 so that the server hardware can keep up. And then also you would change some settings as far as allowing daily backups, which we highly recommend, uh, so that you don't lose the world that the teams are working and building on. And you could set some IP address information, too, so that people can connect from home. It's a little bit more advanced. When you do set up the server for the first time, you're going to want to generate a random world. Uh, again, if you remember that screenshot we showed at the very beginning of the presentation, the random world will have random hills, mountains, lakes, valleys, trees, everything like that. Uh, and it will be a completely new experience to any players that join that server for the first time. And it's a little tiny here, but when you are in the server software, you can control if there's weather, if there's fire, which is important. Uh, we have it deactivated. You can burn down people's houses. <laughs> so to avoid that, we've turned off that effect for now. Uh, sometimes, though, if kids want to use a portal, you have to activate that. So we just ask them to like catch one of us, and uh, we'll activate that for a few minutes and then turn it off again. Uh, and then you can turn on animals and villagers and other uh, items in the game. So here, these are just some general tips that if you are running Minecraft EDU and if you are running the software, the server software, you know, we started on creative mode when we first set this up in our computer lab. Uh, we have about 14 computers for our teams, and we put the client on each computer. And we had set it up as creative mode. We were hoping that they'd run through the world and build things and have fun. But we quickly switched to survival. The kids themselves had wanted that. They wanted a little bit more competition. And uh, they wanted a little bit more of the element of danger with the mobs in the game and things like that. So if you've never done anything with Minecraft, I would recommend do creative mode for like a week or so, just so you can understand what's going on in the world and how the game works. And then talk to the teams who are playing the game and ask if it's okay to switch it to survival if that's what they want. Uh, when you get the EDU software, you're going to want to create a player and log in as a teacher. And what that's going to do is basically make you the administrator. Uh, you can mute players who are being naughty, using foul language and things like that. Uh, you can reward the nice players by giving them rare items. You can teleport players to different areas, which comes in handy if you're playing uh, the game with the teens and you want to show them something that someone's built or something like that. The worlds are so vast that it's hard to really describe where to go. You can teleport them exactly to your location. 
uh, and it gives you a chance to sort of interact with them and have some fun. And then the one thing that I found here, again, personal experience, is peace. That has to be sort of like the motto for everything you do in this Minecraft world. Peace in Minecraft world. You know, we saw the teens would sometimes devolve into different like bands and, and uh, <laughs> chase each other, steal each other's items and things like that. And that wasn't really cool, especially for the younger players uh, who aren't used to that sort of behavior. So we did a, a policy of peace in Minecraft world. And we reward good behavior, but we will freeze players that are acting inappropriately and things like that. Uh, the other key thing is back up often. So in that server software, there is a way to back up your world file, or you can actually find the world file on the computer and just copy that file to like another folder or something like that in Microsoft Windows just to have backup. Uh, we learned that the hard way, and we basically lost the world that kids have been working on for a few weeks. Uh, they took it in stride, but it was a little bit disappointing because they had built some like huge castles and things like that, and they had uh, stored a lot of items in there. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny we have this. We've had the same experience where it's 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 funny how quickly it can turn into like a Lord of the Flies type of you know piggy every man for themselves. I'm burning down it. I'm fighting that, but it, it's it's fun to see. Um, so just like we were talking about before, you can you can play Minecraft on the computer. There's that EDU version, which we generally uh, would recommend. The commercial version. Additionally, there's also that Minecraft PE or Pocket Edition. That's available for about $7 on Android and iOS devices. Generally, like we said with computers, uh, about a three-year uh, limit. It'll be on the. It'll definitely work on the newer things. Again, it's you go to the Play Store, you go to that App Store, you'll see what uh, if it's available on the devices that you have. I know Jessica has them running on iPads in her children's room. It works great. One of the downsides with that PE edition is that it can't connect to the PC or EDU servers. So it's basically, if you're doing the PE, you're kind of locked into that. They can connect to each other, sort of an ad hoc wireless network that they'll play. If you have four iPads next to each other all on the same Wi-Fi, they can connect that way. But at this point, they're kind of locked into each other. One of the interesting things we're going to talk about is uh, now that Microsoft had purchased Minecraft from Mojang, what's the M words? Microsoft Mo um, there the new Windows 10 version, it's out in beta and it's supporting cross-platform play. So whether you have it on a Windows 10 PC or laptop or Surface tablet or something like that, the new version will be able to bring it all together. So we're kind of interested to see how that works out. We, none of us really have all the new Windows 10 stuff in our library yet, so we're interested to see that should be pretty cool. Uh, additionally, in terms of gaming consoles, whether you guys have that in your libraries already, you're thinking about starting, you know, video game nights, or if you have a video game collection, uh, it's available for the Xbox 360, the Xbox One, the PlayStation's 3, 4, and the Vita. And a Wii U version just came out, I believe, uh, like right after Christmas, the end of December. So that's the newest version that's come out. Uh, they can play local uh, multiplayer together on the same uh, uh, same console, that kind of thing, co-op mode. Again, they can't connect to the PC or EDU, so it's one of those one of those kind of things where, contrary to popular, if you do kind of want to put your eggs uh, all in one basket, whether you're locking into pocket editions or you're doing the ED view or you're doing the uh, the console versions, it's gonna. It's it would be fun to have all the versions, but at that point, if you have some running on the computer, some on a mobile device, some on a PlayStation, it's gonna be very fragmented. The kids are gonna play with each other, and my world is in this mode, not that mode, that kind of thing. The one thing we do want to warn everybody about is there's a game that's out called Minecraft Story Mode, and it's it's fun, but it is it's sort of a, it's a shoot off from Minecraft. It was built uh, a different company made, it, and it's more of a an RPG type of uh, linear game you're playing. It has nothing to do with the building or anything like that. It's kind of just the same look and the character. But you know, if you if you get a good deal on that, you're like, oh, I'm going to buy this. It's not going to be the building. It's not really going to be what we have found is what the success to our library was. That game is kind of it's 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 fun and have it in the collection, but it's not the uh, the greatest. So sort of for the future, uh, Minecraft purchase Mojang in, in September 2014 for two point. $0.5 billion. So that's a little bit more than I'll be winning on Powerball, but I mean, not that much. Uh, they're going to be releasing this Windows 10 version that they're saying will attract newer, younger customers to Windows 10. And by explaining to people that, you know, you upgrade to Windows 10 and you'll have your Minecraft world on any device, all any which way you can get it, they're hoping that'll really bring uh, the fragmentation of Windows down. 
and they'll have a higher uh, conversion rate. So that should be interesting to see as this all sorts of all sorts of come in, that comes out with all the new upgrades and changes and all the new cool ways you can play at Minecraft. So this is something that's a little bit further out on the horizon, but since Microsoft purchased uh, Minecraft and Microsoft has been developing a VR headset called HoloLens, which is like virtual reality, they're using Minecraft as a way to demo that technology. Uh, this slide originally we had an embedded YouTube video, and again, it's on the handout. Definitely click that link and check it out. It's really awesome to see Minecraft in 3D, in virtual reality. Um, so. I don't know if we'll be setting this up in our libraries this year, but it is something to be aware of where all this technology is headed and the immersive experience and Minecraft might be at the center of that. So incorporating Minecraft into your library is a fantastic thing we've all, uh, we've all come to realize. Uh, some of those great things, it already has that dedicated fan base that if you just decide we're going to start having a Minecraft night or like Lisa has done with Minecraft parties, that kind of thing, you're going to see kids come out of the woodwork, you know, coming from the middle school that maybe you've never seen in the library before, but you mentioned Minecraft and it's going to, these kids are going to go crazy and wild and they love it. So again, it's that incentive for kids that maybe don't come to library that often. You see them once in a while to do a project, and then they never come back. By having this, it's that other another avenue to bring kids in and get them involved in the library. Uh, you can have different types of programs. We're going to talk about all the different things you can do in the library. But whether you're bringing elementary school kids in, or middle schoolers, high schoolers, adults, everybody can find tap into something with Minecraft. Whether it's you know those STEM, the science, technology, engineering portions, it's the creativity portions where it's, you know, the different skins and all that kind of thing, but it, it really, it's, it, everybody loves it and it's a great thing to have in your library to incorporate in and you can get, you can tap into new kids that maybe haven't come into the library, get them involved, and it's been really great for our libraries. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about Minecraft programming. And Minecraft programs can really range in both cost, in technology, and skill level. And when I say skill level, I mean for both the people who come to play Minecraft at your library, as well as for the people who host the events, such as librarians. So here's just some ideas. Um, and you should really do whatever makes you feel comfortable, because there's so many options for incorporating Minecraft in your library. So the first thing you could do is have some passive programming. You could download Minecraft on all of your libraries or some of your library's computers. Um, if you have iPads that either patrons can use in the building or if they can borrow them, you can install Minecraft. Another option is to incorporate Minecraft into existing programs or into other programs. For instance, if you have a video game night for kids or for teens, you could offer Minecraft on what James was saying before, on a PlayStation, on a Xbox, or even on a Wii U if you have that. And then another option is to offer exclusive Minecraft programs. At my library, we offer free play nights and challenge nights. Right now, they're just for children ages 6 to 12, but I don't see why you can't use these programs for teens or for even maybe adults. So during free play nights, kids are invited to use the library's iPads, our computers. We have a PlayStation 3 that they can play Minecraft on. Um, they could also bring their own devices from home as long as Minecraft is already installed. And when they come for free play nights, they just free play. Um, they just you know play the game. They talk about Minecraft. The only rule, which we've kind of talked about a few times during this presentation, is that they are not allowed to burn each other's houses down. Um, it's been a problem. Kids get very emotional. I don't blame them. So that's just pretty much our only rule. And then during challenge nights, it's a little different. Um, during the program, the children have a specific task that they have to complete by the end of the program. Um, I've done scavenger hunts within the game. Those are really fun. I've also had them, um, like for Halloween, they had to build a zombie house and then throw a Halloween party. And basically to do that, they just filled the house with every monster possible in the game. And it was a lot of fun. You could have different incentives like prizes. You could have certificates for you know the best creation, the scariest house, you know, anything you want to do. And you could get really creative with it. Some other ideas are to demo worlds built or host uh, building competition for different ages, for all ages. You could host a Minecraft party or a craft party, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And you know what? If you ever get stuck and you really don't know which direction to go into, um, ask the kids and teens at your library. They bring their own knowledge. They love Minecraft, and they could offer their opinions on what you should do.
So this is a little bit more advanced. This is something we've been doing here at Westbury for a few weeks now. Uh, there's a piece of software called MineWeas, and basically it plugs into Minecraft and then will spit out structures into a format that can be 3D printed. So we've been using Minecraft as a tool for the kids to basically log into a very flat, plain world. We give them all the building materials, and they'll build structures like castles, houses, cars, spaceships, and things like that. And then using the MineWeas software, we can take what they created and spit it out uh, in a 3D printer. So a little bit more advanced, but it's not too complicated. If you have a 3D printer and if you're looking for a good application for it or a way of doing 3D printing with uh, tweens or kids, this is a great way of doing it. So it's something that's a little bit more advanced, but it's something you should definitely be aware of. So now we're going to take a step back from the really advanced <laughs> Minecraft programming and talk a little bit about Minecraft crafts. Um, so Minecraft programs don't have to be high tech. You could host a simple Minecraft craft night or a craft program. Um, we've done two or three at my library over the past couple of years, and they're really fun. They're cost effective. And the great thing is you could get your feet wet with the world of Minecraft. And also, you could gauge the Minecraft interest in your community. So before you go out and spend money on Minecraft EDU licenses or on iPads or on gaming consoles, you can see if people actually like Minecraft in your community and see if they're willing to come to a Minecraft program at your library. So uh, here's a list of some crafts that we made at my library. Hands down, the most popular ones are those keychains made out of pearler beads. If you're not familiar with pearler beads, you could buy them at any craft store like Michael's or AC Moore. They're these little beads that come in various colors, and when you buy them, you also get these grids. So basically, you just take the beads and you kind of put them in a pattern. Or you can make your own. You can print patterns off um, off of Google or anywhere. And um, we've done it at my library. We made creeper face keychains. We made diamond pickaxes, which is the corner on um, the top right corner. You can see a picture of that. So that's a lot of fun. And it's always neat seeing the kids come to the library with their cre uh, creeper keychains attached to their backpacks. You can also make door hangers. You could have the kids make their own Minecraft. Uh, mask. Paper crafts are kind of like origami. Um, you can find a lot online. Pixel art is when you take red line paper and you just have the kids either make Minecraft characters or sketch their own Minecraft worlds and bookmarks. So you can really do anything with a Minecraft craft program. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, so what I did in my library because we don't have any Minecraft right now at the Massachusetts Library, um, but I definitely want to introduce it. And I'm a teen librarian, so I said, well, let me start with the teens. I know there's got to be kids that are interested in it, but let me see what our teen population is into. So rather than go out and buy, you know, either Minecraft EDU or buy iPads, I said, let's use what we have. So I decided to have a Minecraft party. Um, I had it on a Saturday in November. Um, I had about, I think, 15 teens sign up and 12 came, which actually isn't, it sounds like a low number, but it's not a terrible number for teen events at my library. Um, they ranged in grades pretty much 7th through 9th, and there were a couple of kids that were, I think, in like 5th and 6th grade. Um, so it was a little bit of the younger teens that came to the, came to the party. Um, I had, <laughs> I had it basically everything. I said you can bring your own device, so if you have an iPad, iPod, iPhone, whatever, a tablet, you can bring that and play with people. Um, we have an Xbox 360 at my library, which you can kind of see the middle picture of. And at that point, we had three kids playing together on that, so they didn't have to bring anything for that part of the party. Um, I also have a couple of laptops I had access to, so I, I downloaded the commercial edition of Minecraft, which is just so you guys know, it's free to download. You just need to have the um, username. You have to purchase the actual um, ID to play the game, but it's totally free to download. So I downloaded it on a couple of laptops, and I said if any kids had their own Minecraft ID that they could sign in and play, which a couple of kids did. I had three kids playing together on that. Um, I also had some snacks. You can see a picture on the top left of those are just little Hershey bars, the little gold ones. I think they have the almonds in them. And I made a little sign that said gold ingots, because they kind of look like gold ingots. <laughs> and the kids love I have on the top right the water bottles that I just printed out. I didn't make that sign, the potions. I think it's a potion of healing or potion of something. Um, I printed it out, taped it on. Kids loved it. I had marshmallows that were snowballs, Oreos that were obsidian. I had a couple of different things. Pretzel sticks were sticks. <laughs> 
And the kids, they loved it. They got to eat snacks and say, oh, look at this. This looks like Minecraft. Um, so they loved that. And I think it was an hour and a half long. The kids had a great time. And I could then go to my director and say, we have teens that are interested. And they want to they play Minecraft more. So we can go ahead with, with that. So hopefully we'll have a service soon. And spoiler alert, I am not super duper creative. I got a lot of these ideas from Pinterest. Um, so if you're like me and you really just you don't know you're not very crafty, go to Pinterest, sign up for a free account, and just type in Minecraft. Type in Minecraft parties. You're going to get tons of ideas. Um, in this image here that we have in the like kind of middle left, you can see Minecraft Bingo. That's something that I printed. Had the kids play at the party. It, it's super easy. A lot of the ideas for the food came from that. I think you can see maybe in the top right, it looks like someone has Rice Krispie treats with green frosting on it, and they called it um, dirt block or grass blocks. So a lot of my ideas came from Pinterest, and I highly, highly recommend checking it out. So one of the more traditional ways you can add Minecraft into your library also is uh, the building a Minecraft collection of books. So the main series that we've had at our library, which has been really popular, are the Mojang published complete handbook collection. And those are the ones on the right of the screen. You'll see the green, the red. And those have the different recipes that you can make the tools out of. They have different things you can build with redstone, which is the electricity in the game. And these have been fantastic to have in the collection. And they've really been circling like crazy. We initially bought two copies of each. At this point, we had to buy another two sets of everything because they've been going out a lot. Additionally, uh, Four Dummies came out with some books. So that Minecraft mining for kids is really good if you want to bring uh, less of a leisurely and casual, more educational aspect to it. They can you know, learn about mine, uh, modding the game and stuff like that. And Redstone is something that, in our experience, we've seen some of the kids have gone completely hog wild for. I personally, I now have realized I'm too dumb to understand it myself. But kids have actually made, again, I think it might be in PDF, we had a video of another point. They've made actually a working calculator and a working computer, like a word processor, from the, in, the inside the game using Redstone. It's how, it's, they're, they're basically electricity. You can build anywhere from simple to complex circuits, anything to just standing on sort of a pressure plate and turning on lights and opening doors and that kind of thing, to some of this crazy thing I've seen, like music, music boxes made, uh, word processors, calculators. It's completely bonkers what some of these people have done online, and the kids love it, and then they try and do that. So having one of those Redstone resource books in your library is a great idea. There's another series. I'm not sure if anybody has them. I think Jessica might. They're these uh, young reader sort of chapter book things that are based off of Minecraft. We haven't got them in my library yet. No one's really asked for them. I've seen them when they were they were at Book Expo. They were Comic Con. They're always promoting them. They're sort of like sort of like a fan fiction type of thing based in the world of Minecraft, where it's a guy he's running around. He's adventure novels. There's creepers. So those would also be interesting to have. Even if you did something where, it, as in reading incentive program, you use them as prize or something like that, you know, there are those cheaper paperbacks, so there, you know, there's different types of books, you can, different cost levels, that kind of thing, so, like uh, Lisa and Jessica were saying before, it doesn't have to be, to have Minecraft in your library, it doesn't have to be that we're bu buying new sets of computers and servers and this and that, you can sort of do, you know, a Pinterest party, bring your own device, have some of these paperbacks, and you can do it and sort of build the interest and see what's going on in your library, who's interested in Minecraft, and then you can use it to sort of build that population out say, oh, look, we had enough people bringing their own devices. Maybe now we want to invest and, you know, get the server and that kind of thing and get the ball rolling and slowly build it up. Okay, so this brings us to our last slide. Um, when you decide to offer Minecraft at your library, you might face some criticism. It could be in the form of a board trustee or a patron who doesn't agree with using library money to buy a computer or video games for the library. It could also be a parent who feels that Minecraft is too addictive or even too violent for children to play. And really, the best thing you can do uh, in the face of criticism is to promote the positive aspects of Minecraft. According to the, My uh, oops, sorry. <laughs> the Common Sense Media Organization, they say that Minecraft um, helps a child enhance their understanding of science and math. It can help a child develop their thinking and reasoning skills, their creativity skills, and even their collaboration skills if they're playing on multiplayer. Another thing you can do is make yourself aware of the recommended age ratings for Minecraft. The Entertainment Software Ratings Board, known as the ESRB, they rate different video games. And they rate the Xbox version of Minecraft ages 10 and up due to mild fantasy violence. 
Um, additionally, the iTunes Store rates the PE version ages 9 and up also for the same reason. So if you're thinking about offering a Minecraft program for children, you could use those recommended age guidelines to kind of figure out what age group you want to gear your Minecraft program to. You could also make parents aware of those recommended ages if they're kind of on the fence about whether or not they should allow their child to play Minecraft at the library. And as with any activity, parents you know, just want to limit the time spent that kids play on the computer or on their iPad, so you could promote that as well. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add. Okay, I think we're going to now open the floor to questions. So if you guys have any questions about anything we talked about, feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll try to answer. So here for the Q&A, we can actually see if anyone is typing. Uh, so we'll see any activity. But if no one has any questions, oh, here we go. OK, we've got a few people asking questions now, so that's great. And just in the meantime, as we're waiting for these questions to pop up, uh, we wanted to just say thank you to everyone. We also wanted to share our email addresses. So if you have any questions about Minecraft, feel free to email any one of us. Uh, if you leave this presentation and you know, tomorrow a question pops into your head, feel free to reach out to any one of us. Ask any sort of question, we'll try to help you out. OK, so here we have a question from Stephanie. Uh, with Minecraft EDU, can you set up two different games, one on create mode and one on survival? So I would see, you know, basically to do something like that, you're going to have to have two instances of the server running. So you actually need two server licenses and to run it twice. So that would get a little complicated. Uh, I would say you're probably going to want to just have the server running in one mode at a time only. Otherwise, it's going to get a little complex from a technical standpoint. Tuesday you log into a creative mode, then Wednesday you do it on survival, you can have yeah. multiple worlds. Actually, that's a good idea, James. So something you could do is set up a calendar. Uh, when you're in server software, it's extremely easy to switch it from creative mode to survival mode. It's a matter of just you know clicking on a little checkbox. And it's also extremely easy to switch the worlds that you've saved. Uh, so you could create a calendar where it's like, hey, you know, Monday through Thursday, it's creative mode, but Fridays we're doing survival, so things are going to get crazy. And you can let the kids know about that. OK, so we have a question here from Kate. And it says, if I had it loaded in the school library, the EDU version, I can use that login at home to learn it myself. And I don't see any reason why not. So the server, if you put it on your school network, and you may need help from your IT staff to do so, you could actually uh, open up a port on the firewall so that the server can be seen from the outside world. Once you do that and you get the IP address, which is the unique identifier for that server. You could put the EDU software on your computer at home and just tell Minecraft, connect to this IP address, and you should be able to connect through to the server. Uh, we have a tech here who actually does that. Sometimes he logs in just because he likes playing Minecraft, and he might poke around on the uh, EDU server just to see what kids have built. Or he might surprise them by building like a giant structure or something like that. Scrolling up. Uh, so we have a question from Jacqueline. As for the pricing, is it a one-time only purchase, or is it an annual fee? Uh, for Minecraft EDU, it's one-time only. Once you have those server licenses and those user licenses, uh, you're locked in, and that's that. In terms of the pocketed, so the, the console games, again, every time they, if they release Minecraft 2.0 or something like that, you'd have to rebuy. But I believe now even the, the commercial versions of the game and the pocket edition, they've kind of been, they've been pushing out upgrades, updates and upgrades as they go with different mobs, different blocks, that kind of thing. But it's generally been, if you bought it, even if you bought it in during the beta mode, which I know I did years ago, I've been getting those upgrades uh, included. So that's pretty great. Let's see. Ashling, I'm a small, low-budget library. There's been interest expressed by the few teens and teens that come in. What would be the best way to just get started? One EDU server, one computer. Second question, from the EDU. You on the team room computer, can kids who bring their own device play with those on the library computer? So the second part of that question is much easier to answer, and it was similar to the question, the answer we just gave about playing at home, which is, yeah, if you have an EDU server running and it's open on public on that firewall, then yes, the kids could log in that way, although they would need the EDU clients on their computer. So even if they had commercial version, 
they would have to put the so right, they would have to put the software that you purchase on your computer on the library purchase software on their computer. So that might be a little dicey on your end. I don't know how you guys feel about that, but that would be how they they could feasibly connect uh, from that client mode. Uh, to go back to the first part, what would be the best way to just get started? Um, it really depends, uh, I mean, I'll pass the microphone around at some point, it really depends on what you have already in your library. I know if you have tablets or something like that, maybe the Pocket Edition is the way to go because you can play that way. If you have uh, an Xbox or something lying around that you had used for a game nights, the problem we ran into is that they don't have a Wii version, they only have Wii U, so we had a Wii, we've been having Wii nights on for years, and there was nothing we could use with that. I don't know. Would, you, would anybody say one way or another? Oh, just chime in. Uh, you know, it might be easy. You know, if you don't have a, a huge amount of technical knowledge, you may want to think about going the video game console route and just buying a software and hooking it up to a television or even a projector. It's uh, pretty simple. You just have the four controllers, and the kids would probably even know how to get the game up and running uh, right, right there. If you want to go like a little bit of a step higher, you can buy the Pocket Edition and put it on tablets, whether it's Android tablets or something like that. And again, it's going to be minimal setup. The ideal setup, or at least what we found here, uh, it's a little bit more challenging than those two first steps. It's using the EDU server and the EDU client. And if you are thinking of going the server route, I saw part of the question was, should I have one server and one client? I would highly, highly recommend having two clients. You're really going to want the kids to be socializing and interacting with each other, or sort of working in a pair or something like that. The game is going to be pretty lonely and somewhat boring as just one player running around. And I think other comments? Oh, yeah. I was just going to add that depending on the size of your building, you could probably get away with just one server for the entire building. Depending on the size, you might have to get two. At my library, we just have one Minecraft EDU server. We started out, we have four computers in our children's room, so we started out with two clients, and now we're up to four. And hopefully soon we'll be adding them to our adult computers, which is downstairs in my library. So we'll see how that, wo that works well with the server. And again, and this is Minecraft 1.1, so we're just covering the basics. But if you are going to set up a server, it's not super challenging. You may need a little bit of assistance from your IT staff. Um, but there are great server guides online uh, for setting up a Minecraft server. And, and it could walk you through the whole process. OK, so we have a comment here from Sharon. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Our library is doing a Minecraft camp during February break, which is awesome. We are super excited. We actually obtained a grant, and we were able to purchase laptops and programs. So that's awesome. You know, and grants might be the way to go. Uh, we recently got a technology grant here at the library. And for the politicians that have you know, backed the library and some of the exciting things we do here, when we say Minecraft is all about creativity, building, and it ties into STEAM and things like that, and STEM programs, they love hearing that, and they feel like their money is really being uh, you know, going towards something that's very positive. So you can always work that angle. Uh, again, creativity is key for us. We, we just love seeing the kids working together cooperatively to create objects and things like that. And I uh, see so we have one last question from uh, where do laptops fall, PC or tablet? So generally, for the most part, any traditional laptop you had or anything like that would fall into the, the PC category. And those can be used with Minecraft EDU or something like that. I know the Microsoft Surface, that's more like a tablet. iPads, those are the tablets with the touch screens. Uh, they're kind of all getting molded together. But again, the traditional laptops, anything like that, would fall into a PC where they could be using the uh, commercial version or the ED version, they wouldn't be using the pocket edition. So we're looking, any other, any more questions, anything else anybody needs us to go over, anything like that? Thank you. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so we just want to say thank you to everyone for uh, participating today. Oh, we've got one more person typing, a few more people typing. Okay. Great. So again, if you have any questions, definitely reach out to us via email. Um, it's on this slide here. Um, whether it's anything about crafts, uh, setting up a server, running, you know, the client or anything like that, pocket edition, you know, we'd be more than happy to help anyone. Any final thoughts? Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. So just wanted to repeat that. Thank you so much to everyone. And I want to thank Carolyn. Uh, for putting this together. Uh, 
you know, this is really awesome. We're super excited about Minecraft, and we're so happy that other people in New York State are hoping to roll out Minecraft programs in their library. So on that note, I think I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn. Uh, thank you. And um, Jessica, Lisa, Bye. James, and James, thank you so much for your time. It's a fantastic presentation. Um, and I want to thank everyone who came in to join us today. Um, I hope that you found it as, uh, as a great presentation as well. And we have even more for you. I'm going to be emailing out a PDF that our presenters put together with links. So um, you can follow up with those. And I'll also include everyone's email addresses. So in case you didn't get a chance to capture them on this slide right here, you'll get those as well. And um, of course, I will also be sending an evaluation. And um, your feedback is so important for us. We'll share it with the presenters as well for improving um, services from Southeastern New York Library Resources Council. And you can let the presenters know uh, what you thought. It um, seems like everyone was pretty happy, and I think it's great. Um, and I will also, we did a recording of this, so we will be sending you the recording, which might uh, take a little bit more time. Um, if I don't get that done by tomorrow, I'll send that separately. And um, thank you again to everyone, and I hope everyone has a great day. And I'm going to go ahead and end the recording.